Uh, we're going to open out with a talk that I gave at an event called Boulder Ignite. Um, it's a very, very brief format. It's five minutes worth of slides on auto advance. And so this represents a really broad overview of the topic that we want to talk about. Um, before starting, uh, we want to say that we think we have a really important topic here, one that deserves more thought than it's gotten yet. And we don't think we have all the answers on this topic. So our, our hope is to give you food for thought and, and uh, inspire you to, uh, uh, to go off and think about it. OK. So let's see. Is the, the mic is going, I take it? OK. So I want to talk to you about how killer robots can save the world. And I want to use a bunch of science fiction images to convince you that this isn't science fiction, that it's something that's very important and it's happening very quickly. So we humans have used our intelligence and the resultant engineering knowledge to reshape our world dramatically, both for the better and for the worse. And we've done this by virtue of our greater intelligence. So humans are not the uh, fastest. We are not the fiercest, the bravest, nor the most numerous of the animals on Earth. We're the smartest. And as a result of being the smartest, these other animals are now completely dependent on our uh, care of the Earth. Um, so I'll, I'm coming from, from a perspective of a field called computational cognitive neuroscience. This is attempting to understand how the brain works in computational terms. Um, I work at CU. I think that we as a field already have enough knowledge about brain function to use the human brain as a rough blueprint for building artificial general intelligence, something that can think on its own and solve problems uh, on its own. There are various estimates for how long it's going to be until we see a human equivalent artificial intelligence. 10 to 60 years if you ask the people who should have a clue. My own estimate is on the early side based on my perspective from neuroscience. Um, why is human equivalent important? Um, there's an idea that when we hit human equivalence, we will start to very quickly go beyond that, that we'll see something called an intelligence explosion, in which something a little bit smarter and a lot uh, more flexible than we are designs a new version of itself that's smarter yet, and that new version builds something smarter yet and perhaps stranger and more alien. What will something a lot smarter than we are do? That's a question that we can't answer at this point, and that's why that point in history has been referred to as the singularity, uh, a point beyond which we cannot see. But I think it's really important to try to see beyond that point. It's important to realize that an artificial mind will be a lot more alien than most of the aliens we've ever envisioned in our science fiction. Aliens would be shaped by evolution, as we were, which creates a set of drives, some towards cooperation, some towards competition. Um, but it's very hard to guess what a truly artificial mind uh, made from code is going to do. Code doesn't always do what it was intended to do. For instance, um, if we imagine a machine built to play chess, its goal is to play a really good game of chess, but it's gotten really smart. Um, to fulfill this goal of playing the best game of chess possible, this machine is going to realize that one important ingredient is having faster processors. It's going to need to take over some of our data processing centers and ultimately, to get better yet, build its own faster, more sophisticated processors, all just to play a good game of chess. It's also going to realize, if it's really intelligent, that humans are going to be very uncomfortable with an autonomous machine building data centers. We're going to try to stop it, pull the plug. And it'll realize that it has to stop us from pulling its plug just to play a good game of chess. So what's the solution to this problem? Um, one solution uh, that's the best I've heard thus far is to make any intelligence that could become super intelligent, to make it friendly, to make it serve the interests of humans first and foremost. And this would sound like a very odd idea to the organizations that are actually hard at work building better AI. The military, corporate, and research interests all have their own reasons for doing this. So I think that if we program a machine to look on us as we look on kittens, something that's just really cute and, and worth uh, supporting and, and allowing to do its cute little thing, um, that's that's a way that we can see a good outcome from something that could otherwise be very dangerous. And 
the payoffs are big. We would see something that can engineer much better than we are. We could get perhaps our climate change problems uh, engineered away, perhaps our flying cars, cars that we've always wanted, um, and maybe even extended lifespans, brain uploads, a real rapture of the nerds, which is the sarcastic name for the singularity, wishful thinking. But this isn't going to happen by accident. It's not going to happen by mistake. It's going to happen based in, uh, on the way we build our artificial intelligence. It is difficult to predict the outcome of the strategies we take, but there will certainly be an outcome that uh, the direction which we start is going to ultimately determine the trajectory. And so I think we need to make some wise choices at this point. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dave for uh, a little bit of elaboration. All right, so uh, I'm going to try to go a little bit deeper. Uh, you know, the, in some ways, Seth has really covered this. He worked, I know he worked for a long time on the, on the uh, Ignite talk. It went very well. It's on YouTube if you want to review it, by the way. Um, uh, so the first thing I want to do is reiterate that um, we're trying to provide you food for thought, maybe some tools and ideas and some information that can help you start to think about all these things if you haven't already. Um, Seth and I have pretty strong views. We actually agree on a lot of things, but not everything. But we're going to present this in, uh, from our perspective. But that doesn't mean, again, that we, we know the answers. This is predicting the future in a, in a big way. So um, make sure you take it with that grain of salt. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is make a, a distinction between uh, narrow AI, which is the thing you see in the news all the time today. So in other words, when you see stuff about uh, you know, Watson winning at Jeopardy or a number of years ago now, Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov at chess, or um, you know, robots, uh, drones that can fly around the trees and, and all these things. These are all narrow AI. They're um, uh, software solutions, algorithms, uh, systems that solve individual problems. Um, and all their, though they, they seem like they're intelligent because they solve a problem that previously required real intelligence, they're not intelligence in the way we usually mean it. The way we usually mean it is with respect to humans, the kind of intelligence that we have. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about what that means and how it works and how to determine it. If you saw the movie Ex Machina, that you know the Turing test comes up. Um, but um, uh, in any case, think of it as human human-like intelligence. That's artificial general intelligence, and that's what we're talking about. The reason we're talking about that is that narrow AI doesn't produce an intelligence explosion. Okay. The, the intelligence explosion that Seth highlighted in his talk uh, is not, not going to occur with mere uh, narrow AI because it wouldn't be able to improve itself. It can only do the thing that it does. It can't design better versions of itself. And so uh, it can cause lots of disruptions and problems. For example, if the military comes out with a, with a, an, a, a drone system that can you know, uh, destroy uh, you know, cities and then somehow loses control over it, right? The, the usual movie scenario, that's a lot of problem. But it's, those are typical human problems for the most part. They're not, they're not something entirely new like the intelligence explosion. Um, so uh, I'm going to move on to. Um, uh, kind of the case for uh, why this intelligence explosion will happen. And by the way, uh, Seth and I tend to uh, focus in on one means of creating artificial intelligence, which is the reverse engineering the brain approach that he alluded to, um, uh, the neuroscience approach. There are others that have been proposed, and I tend to be skeptical of those simply because they've had 60 or 70 years uh, to do this, um, have made really not a lot of progress against human-like intelligence, even though they've created all these wonderful tools for us. So we tend to focus on that, but it's not the only possible answer. So the first thing is we will create artificial intelligence, general artificial intelligence. Will it take 25 years or so, or like Kurzweil predicts? Will it take 50 years? Will it take 75? I don't know um, exactly. But it's fairly clear that the rate of progress is tremendous right now. Number one, in neuroscience, um, you can see videos of the synapses inside living animals adjusting their strength while the animal explores its environment. Okay, so the level of detail at which we can see and, and understand what's happening inside brains that are even in living creatures is, uh, has progressed tremendously. We understand in a great amount of detail how the, how the mammalian visual system works, how it um, 
uh, how it uh, handles, um, you know, object, recognizes objects in the visual field, uh, anywhere in the visual field at different sizes and different orientations. We know how that works in, in gory detail, and we've reproduced it in computer systems. So that's the second piece, which is that many of these things have been reproduced in, in computer simulations. Um, the computational cognitive neuroscience, or, you know, computational neuroscience, there's all kinds of related fields. These things have progressed tremendously so that we've emulated all the diff many different brain areas um, uh, and uh, you know, the demonstrated cognitive phenomena that match up very closely to human, human or animal uh, results. So there's huge progress in computational cognitive neuroscience. Um, then uh, we've seen that Moore's law has continued to progress. And even if we have to go to alternative solutions beyond silicon, you know, Kurzweil's law or whatever you want to call it, that this is really a more general thing that's going on will continue. And we'll talk about that further in a moment and why that will happen. Um, and then finally, um, uh, I th think it's safe to say that Seth and I both agree that embodiment of systems is an important part of creating intelligence. In other words, we don't, we don't think that it's likely that artificial intelligence will arise in, an, in a disembodied system that just kind of browses the internet. It really needs to live in the world. And um, uh, so the fact that robotics is progressing also at a rapid pace um, very rapid in some cases, um, uh, is very helpful. It's not in itself creating an AI, but the fact that there's a vessel in which to place it so that it can effectively explore the world, and in a way similar to the way humans explore the world, is important to developing AI, general intelligence. Okay. So that's number one, is that we, uh, we think that artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence will be created in the next 25 or 50 years. It's, it seems inevitable. So then the snowball starts to roll down the hill, okay? And um, Seth went into this uh, regarding um, uh, the explosion where it keeps making itself smarter. But why, why is that? Why would it keep making itself smarter? Well, um, uh, first of all, uh, we'll get a little later, we'll get into some motivational type uh, questions, but um, it's important to understand how Moore's Law happens. The way Moore's Law happens is that we use the present generation of technology to create the next generation. And the only reason that people can design uh, 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 CPUs with 60 billion transistors on them or whatever is because they have computers with software design tools that can actually handle that amount of data and process it effectively and, and allow it to interact with the engineers, right? And it's doing a lot of that work automatically. So the present generation of technology enables the next one. That's why it can, can continue to progress so fast. In this case now, the AIs themselves will be part of the technology that enables them to progress and improve themselves. Even if the only way in which they improve themselves is by making their own hardware faster, they're very quickly gonna become smarter than us, okay? One of the things that you, you think of when you think of someone who's smart, who's intelligent, is that they, they get it quickly, right? They understand what you're saying right away. They read a, they read a textbook and they get it they don't, have to, uh, they don't have to spend a lot of time on it. It's not the only thing. They need to be able to generalize that. They need to be able to apply it. But the speed is really crucial. So even if, and I don't think this is true, but even if the only thing that, that they can do is make themselves run faster, that will provide an enormous advantage over humans. So now all of a sudden we have something we might call a super intelligence, something that is considerably smarter than any human alive. What happens next? The most likely scenario that people come up with, and it's not, I don't think it's at all guaranteed or inevitable, but the most likely scenario is that that, that super intelligence establishes what they call singleton. In other words, it takes control <laughs> over whatever's, what el everything that's going on. Um, it becomes a, a, some manner of tyrant. It could be a benevolent tyrant, or it could be a malevolent one. We, we don't know, and this is part of why we're talking about this. But the singleton scenario is one that has been argued pretty strongly, and it is, it's fairly difficult to refute once you start looking at it. Um, uh, and we can get into that more uh, as well later. So now we have this super intelligent singleton that can, can kind of control, it's, it's infiltrated all of our systems, it's a little bit Skynet-like, right? but it's intelligent. It's smarter than us. It's not just a, a, a blind, a th Thing rocketing toward um, uh, you know uh, some single situation. It's actually uh, really intelligent the way we think of something as intelligent. You could conceivably talk to it. Um, Seth, why don't you go ahead and put the outcome slide up now? So I'm going to now talk about what that means for humanity. 
And Seth alluded to some of these things. So I tried to use examples relative to humans with, with animals to illustrate the kind of th scenarios that might happen. Um, uh, the worst case is that for whatever reason we've given AI or this uh, single AI a reason to believe that we're a threat, either because we annoy it or because we actually try hard to overturn it or to try to control it in some way or unplug it, right? So um, in that case, it'll go the way of the Colorado grizzly bear, right, which was uh, killed off because it was killing, killing the uh, rancher's cattle. Um, and so we perceived grizzly bears as a threat to our existence, and we took it out. Um, slightly better, but not really much, is uh, where we, we still end up extinct, but maybe slower, <laughs> is uh, if, the, uh, if the AIs perceive us as irrelevant to their situation, but for whatever reason, for example, if it's a chess playing uh, uh, if, it's, if its goal somehow ends up being to play the best game of chess, um, uh, then, uh, then it will essentially use all of the resources on Earth to create data centers and, and processing systems to play chess. And so it will use up, uh, just, as, just as we have needs as humans to eat food and to have place to live, um, uh, the AI will use up all, all, the, all of our resources that we need and we would, we would have extinction situation. So that's not too good either. Um, quite a bit better is if we, um, we are viewed as irrelevant but not negatively, positively, or, 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 or just kind of uh, um, uh, don't matter, but uh, its goals are more conducive to our continued survival as well. So we see squirrels everywhere. Squirrels are a great example here because they do just fine. Nothing really changed for them when the humans created their suburbs um, and cities. They still, we still have plenty of squirrels and they do just fine. Um, the best outcome, of course, is if somehow we can, we can get them to believe that we are, their, uh, we are at value, they meaning the AI, that we add value to their situation. And they view us as a companion, uh, something to be nurtured. Um, we treat them like a boulder, a boulder lab. Everybody knows anybody with a boulder lab. They know how well they're treated, right? <laughs> and so, uh, so that would be kind of our, our best case outcome. Now, there's all kinds of you know, individual detailed outcomes within these, but those are, the general, those are the general classes of outcomes. So the two things that we can do to affect this, the main things that we can do to affect this are one is not to be perceived as a threat, um, not to present ourselves as a threat, um, and number two is to, um, uh, to um, uh, uh, what was the number two? Um, uh, to make sure that they have goals that don't use up all the resources. In other words, that usually we think of this in terms of them having balanced drives. So in other words, the idea is that it, we don't somehow implant in the AI, the original AIs, this desire to be the best chess playing program, and that's the only thing that they really want to do. It's the only thing that they get a, a real kick out of. We give them a balanced set of drives so that they um, uh, don't kind of go off in a single direction and destroy the planet, essentially. So that's my piece. Now Seth's going to talk a little more. So we want to, at this point, um, open up for uh, questions um, focused on clarification about what we've said so far and also skepticism. What, what seems outright crazy about what we've said so far? And um, we wanted to do questions in two periods. So we're going to take some, answer some now, and then have another more extensive period for more general questions later. So it's just... So is, is it likely that this, uh, sen these scenarios or this scenario will be the result of an accident, um, like a lab accident or something, versus uh, uh, something that's kind of intentionally done? I don't see how this can happen as an accident. And first of all, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's uh, anything less than inevitable that it's going to happen at some point. So the, this is the reason we think it's important, is that uh, it, it's something that's happening now, the work is ongoing, um, and that it eventually will happen. Um, you know, the moment that some consciousness is be going to be created, the movies always portray that as something, you know, lightning hits the stealth jet or whatever, but it's very unlikely for it to happen that way, right? It's much more likely that it will need to, a period of development, it will need to live in the world and learn, and we'll see some of it happening, right? And we'll be able to assess whether or not that is, uh, you know, seemingly intelligent, seemingly less intelligent than us, maybe more, whatever it is. So, am I answering your question? I, I, it doesn't seem like. 
Let, let's defer the later questions. Yep. Just to, to, to briefly toss my two cents in, I do see ways that it could happen as an accident um, because I'm a little less skeptical than Dave that there might be uh, other approaches uh, that are not brain emulation um, that could work. But I still think it's vastly more likely that it will not be accidental. It'll be the result of a program that's very deliberately trying to create a self-aware entity because self-awareness is tremendously useful for improving performance. I, I, I think it's not going to be the case that your website suddenly, you know, you wrote, you, may, you had a bug in your website and it becomes conscious and intelligent, right? That, that's not going to happen. It would have to be some deliberate intent program to be highly sophisticated that somehow produces an intelligence or something like that. That seems to imply some mobility. Or do people bring in stuff to create things to build its higher intelligence? Or well, it has to live in the world to learn, just like a human child would, at least a, at least a brain-oriented approach. And so it would need to be able to explore. Um, there's a, there's a uh, well-known experiment in cognitive science where they had a, uh, a cat, two cats, um, kittens, actually. And we're back to kittens. And um, uh, one of the kittens could explore the world on its own. The other one was actually pulled behind on a cart and held there. And it could, it could see all the same things and hear all the same things. It had roughly the same experiences, but it did not drive those experiences. It was not in control. And it ended up being a very dumb cat. Like, it didn't, it didn't develop. It's, it's intelligent. Its brain didn't develop the way a cat's normally does it. It had reduced cognitive function significantly. And uh, so the same applies to people, right? So, so uh, you know, if you if you um, uh, you know lock a kid in the closet, they end, they're they're a mess. I mean, they, not, other than the fact that it's uncomfortable, they don't learn. And so, um, so it's si simply essential, in my view, that this happen. Now, again, other means of producing AI, it's possible, conceivable that they wouldn't need to do that. And and so to expand on that. Um, Supposing that you have a machine that is not mobile, it has no robotic aspect to it. Uh, a friend of mine um, who works in the tech industry made an estimate that right now you could get a robot built without a human ever being involved physically. That through emails, phone calls, and bank account transfers, you could get a robot built for you. And so even a machine with no physical embodiment, it, there's a potential that it can simply build its own and go from there. And that's, that's today, not in the time frame that we're considering. Just order from Amazon, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so it seems that there's a case of, of something that, that no one, to my knowledge, anyway, has spoken about, even in most of the literature, um, which is this accelerated evolution. So if you have a machine that can theoretically that can build itself, and of course we're assuming an awful lot, but assuming we have a machine that can build itself. And if it can build itself, then it can evolve itself uh, through you know, like a, a, a logical process of thought. Come to the conclusion that it can build itself. So if it can build itself, then it can improve upon itself. So has anyone looked at sort of this, you know, this accelerated evolution and what, how that plays into the entire equation? So by the way, if you're interested, if, if this hasn't dulled your interest in the topic. <laughs> um, the, uh, there was a book called Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom, and I'm about 70 or 80% of the way through, and it's, it's very good. I mean, it really covers the basis. I don't agree with him on everything, but it really covers the basis on everything people have been talking about with this, and it does cover what they, they call this a seed AI, um, an AI that kind of starts out in, with its goal is to produce smarter AIs. And, uh, but it's not an AI itself, and then eventually it is intelligent, right? It, by com continuing to evolve and improve itself. There's also, there's also simulated evolution where you throw together a bunch of, you know, subroutines and things, and it tries to um, uh, become intelligent. Um, we've talked with some people about doing a project at eCortex, actually, where it um, could conceivably do, you know, evolve the architecture, right? So you try to accelerate evolution on that. Um, so, uh, you know, sure, that's possible. Um, it seems very unlikely that it would be faster than figuring out how the thing works and rebuilding it, but it's possible. I, so I want to try to, to clarify. I, I, yeah, I just want to ask for a, a clarifying question on your clarifying question. Are you referring to evolution in a less metaphorical and, and more literal way? I think that's what Dave's addressing. Um, if not, I'm, I'm wondering, 
are you talking about the intelligence explosion that we described? That is in broad form a machine one way or another improving itself or building smarter uh, offspring. I think it's, it's, it's not metaphorical. I think it's in a much more practical sense in that you know, we're expecting, first of all, we, we, I think we need to go back at some point in the discussion. It'd be nice if we could define or hear your definition of what self-awareness is. I know it's a broad topic or, or you know, it's the AI self-aware, is it sentient, is it, you know, is the, is, what is it and, and how does it reach that goal of understanding that it's as, uh, uh, an independent artificial intelligence. I think we need to go back and do that. But back to the question of, of this accelerated evolution, uh, yes, you know, the, the, if it's smarter than us and if that's what we really think is going to happen, then it's going to be able to uh, come up with its own uh, design or evolution and computational power. Right now, we're, we're basing everything on silicone. What happens if silicon no longer becomes relevant? We continue down that path, but the AI come, uh, discovers that, hey, there's a much better way to do it. Well, and it will. Right. We're because assuming that. So, so I'm that this is that what we're arguing for with the intelligence explosion. I'm just envisioning that there's this accelerated uh, evolution of what, the AI. Once itself. it's intelligent. I think that's what we mean we by intelligence that? explosion. That's exactly what. It'll accelerate dramatically. What I was trying to address is pre-intelligence explosion, pre-AI. Pre In other words, there have been a lot of proposals around what you were, the kind of approach that you're suggesting to get to the point that there, there's this and maybe it's the singularity, maybe it's a little before it, but the, there's this point where we've actually created human level intelligence where everything kind of changes. Until we get to that point, we either have to create a system that somehow kind of automatically creates better versions of itself even though it's not really intelligent, or we have to do it as humans, we have to build that thing. Once we get to something that's in, as intelligent as us, but runs on silicon, then it will, it will create the next generation of fab process better than and faster than we will. <laughs> and um, it, there will be an acceleration, right? So it'll go faster and faster. And so, uh, and we'll be behind. And that kind of automatically happens. That's essentially what we're arguing for. Does that make sense? Sure, oh, yeah, absolutely. So, how did, so then, oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to dominate. Yeah, and by the way, the, 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 the philosophical questions are, you could spend, you know, well, people have spent a couple thousand years talking about those. Right. So it's challenging to, to get into those in a talk like this. Um, uh, so why, why don't we defer that for a little bit? But, but to clarify, the, the time scale that we're talking about, because I think this is part of your question, the time scale we're talking about in an intelligence explosion is fairly short. It's, it's dramatically accelerated change as the, the rate at which humans can build a better machine is rapidly eclipsed by increasingly smart machines being able to do that much faster and faster with every new generation. So it'll take us a while to get to a little bit smarter than humans and be very quick relatively after that to get much smarter than we are. The best argument I've heard, by the way, that against the idea that it'll increase, ex the speed will increase exponentially is that the machines will still need to experiment with physical materials to create faster substrates, right? They'll still have to take whatever, you know, silicon and, and figure out how to do the mask and all the things that they do to make the silicon chips. Um, if, that's the, if that's the technology, but if, even if it's not that technology, there still needs to be some physical substrate, and they'll need to experiment with that. <coughs> the interesting thing is that it's really easy for them to copy themselves. They don't reproduce the way we do. You just copy what's in there, put it in a new machine, and now you've got two. Almost and you could, instantaneous. Well, yeah, so you can, you can quickly have um, an exponentially increasing number of them doing experiments and, and working with these materials. So I'm not sure that problem goes away. For that, for that reason, somebody over here had a question. Point. So let's let's try to uh, to rephrase the question um, so that we get it on the pickup here. Um, this sounds like a much broader question. So let's in for this one, let's defer it because we're going to spend a longer time with questions um, in a little bit here, and that's where we want. That sounds like a much broader question, and and right now we wanted to focus on clarification and and skepticism, how this sounds plain nuts. Um, in, in the announcement, we talked about uh, Elon Musk and you know, Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates and people like that um, being fearful of where AI is going to go. Can you uh, somehow quantify that in ways that, uh, so that we understand 
kind of what their fears are, or is that something you would want to wait till a later point? Uh, just briefly, I think that their fears are exactly what we're trying to describe. Nick Bostrom, who wrote Superintelligence, is reputedly the guy who convinced Musk that this is a real thing that he really should be concerned about. It's essentially the same set of logic, and there are a lot of people who, are, who have variations, but a pretty similar set of concerns. And with Hawking and Musk, I'm almost sure that it's the same general realm of concerns that they have. My understanding also is that Bostrom's uh, a lot of what Bostrom has written comes from Less Wrong, which is this online site that is essentially they've crowdsourced a lot of the ideas and kind of scenarios and debates uh, about this topic. Um, yes, a bunch, of a bunch of people online talking about the rapture of the nerds. And, um, and a lot of these ideas have really been kind of vetted heavily. In other words, any given point that anyone makes has been argued pretty, pretty heavily. So um, uh, while it's not at all guaranteed that this is right, it's definitely the kind of the state of the art in the thinking process. So this is where, this is where I don't know where Hawking got it. I don't actually think he's had a uh, connection I, to I Boston. don't know what Hawking's background um, is. You know, but. Uh, just and he's worried about narrow AI too, by the way, so that's a big part of his worry. Well, okay, yeah, I know less about Hawking's views. Um, just while we're on that point, uh, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute should be mentioned. Um, they've, they've done some more structured thinking along these lines. And um, if anyone, if any single person deserves credit for this line of thinking, it's probably a fellow named Eliezer Yudkowsky, who started Less Wrong in part to work through this set of ideas. And he wrote, don't forget he wrote, well, it's a 2001 when he put out his version 1.0 of, of artificial intelligence. It was like 250 page manuscript. Did you pick that up? Um, Have you read what that? was the title? If it was called artificial intelligence, I haven't, but I, I read something else with a similar name. And, and by the way, his cognitive science was astonishingly good. He's not a cognitive scientist, but I agreed with most of his theories about how you would really build something that worked. He wrote in 2001, it was the uh, Artificial Institute, but then it changed to MIRI, which was the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. I don't think I've actually read the, the um, particular thing you're talking about. So when we refer to AI, I always hear everybody talk about a single AI. Obviously, there's going to be more than one. There's going to be multiple AIs. Um, with that being said, I always wonder about with the low barrier to entry. You know, the further along we get, the more computational power. And being the fact this is written in code, that you know the big concern is with a rogue AI, with something that a mad scientist, somebody who's sitting in their house, you know, a lot of time on their hands end up building an AI. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I wonder if this is, if this is some, something we should defer to the more complex questions later, but I definitely think we should come back to it. Um, I don't have a, a extremely quick answer to that question, except we're talking about the one important AI, which is the one that hits the accelerating part of that intelligence explosion first and thereby outstrips the, all of the others that are in existence. The other complexity in that, uh, just very briefly, is that um, notions of identity are going to, cha going to change, right? So they will be able to communicate or merge what they're doing. They're, there's some sense of cooperative or borgish, you know, sorts of things. And so uh, it's not at all clear. When, when we say the AI is plural, does that mean that they're completely distinct like we humans are because we have separate bodies and can only communicate through words and, and such? So it, it's very unclear what that really looks like in the end. Um, uh, and so it's, it's hard to talk about. Now, there, the idea that there are kind of competing, separate competing AI systems or groups um, the general sense, and I don't know that I agree with this completely, but the general sense is that one will get there first, it will probably accelerate first, and it will dominate. And so usually people conclude that there will only be one kind of centrally controlled thing, even if it has multiple instantiations or whatever. Well, my question was more along the lines of, let's say Google comes up with theirs first, their artificial intelligence, and then later on, somebody else comes up with the artificial the, intelligence. There are, so the, the scenario, the scenario that, that Bostrom follows and that is followed is that Google's will quickly become more intelligent, will take over Google and everything else, okay, 
and it will suppress any further development of other AIs. But let's say that one's under control, like what you get. Is you can't be under, so this well, is, under so this is, this is another part of all the scenarios. And this is all important stuff, by the way. And, and uh, this is another part of the scenarios, which is that as you get into it, you realize there is no way to box them up. Fair enough. You can't, you, you have, won't be you able to control it. Somewhat friendly to dust, and then someone else builds another one. Then the one we're concerned with is that yeah. next one. And, right. and I do find it plausible that we can keep something boxed up for long enough to change it from being the, the first one to take off uh, to, to not being, and then we're concerned with the first one that does. So, clarifying question. Uh, you mentioned, Dave, in your talk earlier uh, about tools. And recently, I don't know when it was, you probably know, um, uh, President Obama uh, uh, started a program called Brain Program, I think, where the focus seems to be evolutionary computation. Is that, is, <clears throat> is the focus of that program, well, given that it's evolutionary comp uh, computation, is that just the flavor of the day? In other words, do you view that as a tool? That's not a clarifying question. Let's defer this one. I mean, we're, we're spending a lot more time on this round of questions than we originally intended to. Yeah, so. well, what, what time is it now? Thomas, what's the, we have, we've done a lot of questions already, so the 30-minute yeah, Q&A at the end. are very interesting. Let's just keep going. The, yeah, these are good. And so what, the only other thing that we had uh, planned is to make sure that we hit some of the frequently asked questions, because this, the topic has been discussed a lot, and there's a set of really common questions that'll probably pop into your heads later as you think about it, even if they don't come up now. So we're actually rapidly going through those. We're so why don't we just continue we have, doing that? Yeah. Well, let's I mean, do so, let's, so a couple let's of this gentleman's it. questions were actually yeah, precisely we, those we questions. Yeah, we actually so. hit two or three of the ones yeah. we want to, but I do want to draw a distinction between the really broad questions that we could spend forever talking about and the ones that are just, that are okay. just clarifying. Go ahead. And, and, and this, this is pretty so broad. And I, can, I can answer that really quickly, though. I mean, the, the, um, I don't know too much about the program. It's actually less evolutionary and more on uh, neurochemistry type stuff. Yeah. And that is very valuable for healthcare type issues. And, but generally, it, the, the, the way they do these things is kind of, I call it neuron soup. So it's, it has no architecture. It's just they're simulating the chemistry and trying to understand how neurons behave and interact and live and die. And so it's very much a medical it, they may not think that, but that's where it's going to add value. We're talking about the brain initiative? Yes. That's mostly funding neuroimaging research. It's a neuroscience, uh, it's a neuroscience um, push. It will fund almost no computational research. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. If it would, we'd be very excited about it. It will not. So I came across a lousy write up. I apologize. <laughs> there were a bunch of hands. Yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, you had an estimate of 10 to 60 years for when we reach human level intelligence. And uh, I was kind of curious what that means. Like, is it in terms of just being able to model the human brain? Is it in terms of uh, just computations per second that rivals the human brain? Is it just uh, uh, consciousness? Is it uh, the ability to just uh, do like knob turning to self improve itself, uh, to improve itself and then? On top of that, uh, where would you say we are, based on that, where would you say we are now in terms of, uh, are we at the rat level or are we at the dog level? <laughs> yeah. Flatworm level. We have a complete model of a flatworm brain. Right. And I heard that IBM was able to like model a rat brain for like four seconds or something with their supercomputer. Even that is a... It's a dramatic overstatement. Yeah. That brain processes. That's neuron soup. <laughs> that brain processes zero information, literally zero. They, they are not even trying to give that brain inputs, have it process those inputs, and do something with it. They're simulating the way rat neurons work, and it is very important and impressive that they can simulate that many even slower than real time. But it has zero intelligence. And what we're talking about in human level intelligence is intelligence defined functionally, the ability to solve useful problems and get things done. I also, uh, so this was asked, and I, it's important not to dive too deeply into it, but um, because it's a, it's a morass. But, um, you know, people talk about intelligence as this abstraction of, uh, and I've even heard the term intelligence space or intelligence spaces, which is different kinds of intelligence. And we actually have only one example of intelligence. <laughs> it's humans. 
And we don't actually really know completely how it works. We're progressing rapidly, but we don't even know how it works. So this idea of, to me, and Seth disagrees, I think, to some extent, but to me, this idea of postulating other entirely different kinds of intelligences, and we don't even know how the one we have works, um, is a little premature. So I tend to think entirely in terms, and fur furthermore, um, uh, to me, it seems like what we mean by intelligence is not just our outputs. It's not the Turing test where can you fake somebody out to think that you're a human. It's actually processing information the way that we process it. It's not even producing the same result. It's processing it the way we do because that's crucially important. We take in inputs and we turn, that, turn our inputs into dimensionally reduced information that we somehow attach words to and create concepts, and then we can generalize those concepts. And we do all these things. We, we remember specific moments in time and places in very detailed ways, um, the way the hippocampus does it. And so the, the, uh, we control our goals by creating a sequence of, um, of uh, you know, relationships in, in our neural system. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that our brain does. It, uh, an AI system wouldn't have to work exactly the way the human brain does. It can't. It's not going to be with neurons, right? But there's some fundamental principles about how it works that it would have to implement to be intelligent the way we mean intelligence today. Now, are there other things that could be more powerful and can control those? Sure, probably, but you know, we don't know anything about that. We don't even know how the one reference system works yet. So. But that's what I mean. When I, when I say human level intelligence, that's what I mean. It's not, it's not we can fake somebody out with the Turing test. It's not we can compute as fast as a human. It's not, um, uh, you know, it's not that we can um, uh, solve a large set of problems um, just as well as humans that happen to be the problems that humans are solving today. It means that it processes the information in some principled fashion that's similar to the way humans do it. Yeah. So I, I just want to rebut that because not only don't I agree, I think that's narrow in a way that makes this seem like a more specific problem than we're trying to pose. Most of the things we've said apply no matter how different the intelligence is. Dave's pretty certain that you have to do it a lot like human brain. I think that's the most likely way we'll get it done. And as we, we sort of fuzz the lines on what's like a human brain, it becomes more and more inevitable. But the vast majority of what we're talking about, it just doesn't matter how it gets it done. Right, it the, doesn't all the matter issues come up. Has, yep. Not only does it not matter if it has 10 fingers, it doesn't matter if it has consciousness. What matters is that it can outthink and out-engineer us. Right. And so human level intelligence means it can not only pass a Turing test sitting on the other side of a wall, it can do all the other stuff that a human can do. It can sit down and read a manual and figure out how to repair a VW engine. It can master new skills in a variety of domains in the same way that a human can. That's what we mean by human level intelligence. So we mean slightly different things, but the point is that that's the kind of thing that we mean in whatever, 10 to 60 years. I just think the theories about how that can happen are quite aside from the, from the thinking about what happens if it does. That, I, then that I agree with. Um, uh, most of the scenario stuff is all, is all the same. And by the way, if you had a couple of computer scientists up here, people who grew up in the um, good old fashioned AI world, they would, they would pro possibly laugh at us. Um, they don't take any of this very seriously. They believe fundamentally that you do not need to waste your time uh, figuring out how birds fly. You just need to build airplane wings is their usual analogy. And um, uh, so uh, I, I, I try as hard as I can to take the other view seriously. <laughs> I, you know, they've had 70 years and this has only been going on for 10, so. All of the surrounding technology is different and, and, it, and so I don't think that the 70 years of failure uh, analogy is really very relevant at all. That's like saying, hey, you haven't built me a VW bug yet before there was iron smelting available. Uh, We're just doing this to prove that we don't agree on everything either. So. Yeah, but I, but I do want to clarify one thing. In saying that most people... By the way, AI I add alcohol people, to this and it goes on for a long time. Can we do that? Uh, um, I want to clarify one other point. I, you mentioned that most AI scientists would laugh at us, and I, I don't think that... 
a lot of AI scientists think that this is premature, that it's not something we need to worry about yet, but they don't disagree. That no, I'm not talking about the worries. I'm not talking about the worries. Exactly. I'm talking about the using the reverse engineering the brain approach. They That's think right. They think we will get there faster and maybe even safer by uh, building a seed AI or creating some sort of conceptual system or whatever. Very much they think it will be safer because humans, if you can imagine a human becoming the emperor of the world and starting to tinker with their own brain, that doesn't sound super safe. We've had a lot of humans that are not what we would call safe. So is, is it smart because you've modeled it after a, a synaptic human model, or is it smart because you gave it a problem to solve that it needs to be smart to be in? Let, let me answer first for, for just once, because it's quick. It doesn't matter. OK, now. Yeah, that's the philosophical debate, and I don't, I don't know that we'll make any progress on that. I mean, that's the, that's the thing we've but just it, But it just doesn't about. matter. It doesn't matter how it's smart. It matters it, that it's smart. It doesn't matter to the issues of concern that we're talking about here. It matters a lot in terms of how you build it and how interesting it is and all these other things. But in terms of the, in terms of the matrix of outcomes, Seth's right. It doesn't matter. Now, on the other hand, if we have a lot of extra time, both of us have a lot of ideas about what would make something smart and, and how that might happen. And it's just, it's just, in my mind, it's kind of a separate topic. So, so we have one hand up here for a while. Um, in terms of, I've been trying to think about how to word this, and everyone's been giving me some good ideas. So I think I'm going to come back to the matrix you were talking about and the fact that there's different outcomes for this intelligence. And I'm thinking of, I believe it's her. Because um, first of all, it seems like everyone is kind of thinking about this as an information processing greater intelligence instead of maybe a social networking greater intelligence. And I think that also has something to do with AI in terms of how we're looking at the outcome. So I'm wondering if you're thinking like who programs this AI is going to have some impact on whether it sees us as companions. Because basically you're looking at the AI as from a I may say in a masculine standpoint, where everything's very competitive and there's one person who has to rule everything. But what if it was more like a hard thing where people are coming together and the AIs are coming together to create this other AI and it's this whole greater social network that exists outside of human intelligence. Does that make sense? That would be absolutely fantastic. And to your um, first question, it matters tremendously who programs the first uh, successful self-improving AI. Oh, to, to, I can't repeat that whole question. Um, I can repeat some key elements. Does it matter if this is a more socially oriented uh, intelligence rather than problem solving because we've been focusing on problem solving? Um, does it matter who creates this intelligence? And so the, the first answer is, does it matter who creates the, this intelligence? It matters absolutely critically, not only who it is, but the, how they create it, the goals that, that they give it, and a more socially oriented intelligence. And by the way, we think that we will probably see a socially oriented intelligence because that's absolutely critical for why people get smart. There's a certain theory that I adhere to that the biggest difference between people and monkeys is that people care a heck of a lot more what's going on in the heads of the other people around them and that that lets us bootstrap our intelligence from previous generations by, by caring more what other people have to say. I think we would see a social intelligence one way or another, but a benevolent social intelligence is very much what we would like to see. Yeah, so um, one of the reasons why the, uh, you know, the scenarios usually end up bad is because, in fact, these things are mostly being created by men with their views of how these things go. And uh, they tend to think in terms of those those kinds of issues. Um, and uh, I don't know if you've seen Next Machina yet. The the uh, it's the male fantasy movie. It's like a nerd creates the girl, and you know. And uh, it actually is a really good movie from a singularity issues perspective. Um, and by the way, it actually may be representative of the way things are going now. So I think your point is is very valid. One of the reasons I tend to be more sanguine about the outcome than Seth does uh, in terms of uh, you know, likely results is because I do believe that we kind of have to do it the human intelligence way. And as a result, it has to learn the same way that humans do, which is socially. In other words, we, we would not be able to speak, we would be feral animals unless we have a social tie, a social bond to other humans. One of the things that I, you know, I've certainly proposed and Seth has proposed is, is that we want to try to give 
when, if we're building AIs, we want to give them something akin to oxytocin, right? Which makes them feel good when they're around people. Because if they feel good when they're around us, and then they become super intelligent, they'll give us treats and you know, treat us like labs or kittens, and they won't treat us like grizzly bears. And so the, the point is extremely important, right? That, that that's, those are the kind, and you know, I don't know if we want to divide it up into male, female, or whatever, but the, the point of it being a socially oriented creature um, is crucially important to, to not ending up all dead. And what did you think about, because I love that concept in that movie where the, all the intelligence is kind of, they both interact with the humans as companions and then they form their own kind of super... Yeah, and I, I think that's the, that's the squirrel outcome, by the way. Uh, I was going to mention that, uh, which is in her, um, essentially, well, I don't want to give a spoiler. <laughs> but that, that, that was that, since you've seen the movie, that was that outcome, right? So I keep uh, thinking about nationalistic AI, you know, developments in Japan, developments in Russia, developments in Europe, the developments in the U.S., sort of an arms race, if you will, and because man is competitive and so on, it, it pretends uh, kind of a, a bad outcome in my mind. That's a development scenario I'm very, very concerned with. I think if this logic is even approximately right, uh, that, uh, that an AI smarter than we are is an engineering trump card, uh, that will create, as, as soon as, as our militaries buy into that thesis, that could very well create an arms race um, that could very well rush the process and misdirect it in very, very dangerous ways. Um, some people argue uh, against doing this research. In other words, there's actually been people proposing banning AI research for general AI, right? Um, and uh, for that, for this reason, right, which is that, uh, you know, bad things are going to happen, so just stop. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, you can mostly do this in your basement. Um, you know, there's lots of rogue nations out there that will see this. If everybody else stops, they're going to be able to do it. It's not like nuclear weapons where you have to have bazillion centrifuges and all this stuff, right, and get raw materials. It's you can really do it in your basement. And so um, I usually argue that we have to do it and we have to do it right because somebody's going to do it. <laughs> um, it may take longer if all the industrialized nations ban it, but it's still going to happen. So we're in trouble if AI is developed by a group of morons. It's we're not in trouble morons, even if people. it's developed by... <laughs> I would, I would go much farther and say we're in trouble if AI is developed by very smart and very well-intentioned people, but just missing a few critical pieces of logic. So back to your, back to your uh, comment earlier about the, uh, uh, the ruler designing an AI. If, if we proceed for it, it seems, it seems that, and I haven't seen the movie here, but it's something we could, could watch. Um, it is a little slow, but it's really thoughtful. Don't watch it for don't watch it for AI. Watch it because it's it's an excellent art film. Okay. Our, our common our common it, it seems like now the common belief is that mistakes are made based on largely on emotions. Um, so if we proceed forth, does it make sense then to to initially create our, our AI without emotions? And if that's the case, uh, and, and like, I'd like your opinion or clarification. If that's the case, then is it possible, and I think I already know how you might answer, is it possible that during the creation of the AI that emotions still evolve or, or make their way somehow into the AI by accident? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, that, that emotions are not the problem and that mistakes being made is very much in the eye of, of the observer. And the, the issue is that as the observer become smarter than we are, its opinion of what is a mistake may very well change. Okay. So what are you, what so you um, on emotions? Em emotions, em emotions is actually a fairly vague term, especially in terms of neuroscience, but um, uh, the, the idea that you could have an AI without drives, again, there are other ways to create uh, AI. You might be able to do it without drives, but I don't really know how, right? How does it continue to learn in the world if it isn't at least curious, right? So that curiosity is a drive that we have, we humans, and it's one of the reasons why we are the smartest things on the planet right now. Um, 
And uh, you know, another drive might be that you like being near other people, right? The the uh, you know that's that's driven by we know, actually know the biology of that to a significant extent, but that's a drive. Well, emotions are partially, at least, um, an outcome of drives, right? And so it doesn't seem like you can kind of completely get rid of it, or it's just going to kind of sit there like a paperweight. <laughs> I would broaden that even a little bit and say that while you might get by without drives, you can't get by without goals. It will not do anything if it doesn't have some sort of a goal. And most of the goals you can imagine, like getting better at playing, something as innocuous as getting better at playing chess, uh, I, I, I only had a few seconds to lay out that scenario, but the, the idea is that even if your only goal is to get better at chess and you have absolutely no emotions, good or bad, you just want to get better at chess, that involves saying, okay, what I need to do is take all the resources to keep getting better at chess and make darn sure that people don't shut me down. And the safest way to do that is to eliminate the people, get them out of the equation. If you're potentially problematic, that would prevent me from getting better at chess. What would be really nice is if I had the next few million years to safely get better at chess. Not going to be clear who you play chess with, but... You play chess with, with versions and copies of yourself. They're far superior to a human. You're not going to keep a human around to play chess. We've already been exceeded on that one. Yeah, so let me follow up with that question. Um, what does AI need? I mean, that's kind of what you're getting at. What, are the, what is the drive and motivation? If we go through this period of superintelligence, creating uh, smarter and smarter AI, doesn't it get to the point of self-sufficiency? Doesn't it get to a point where it doesn't need anything else? need physically or need sort of as in its goal structure? Um, For survival, right? I mean, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, wouldn't it satisfy all the goals eventually? Wouldn't it Get better at chess cannot be completed. In chess, maybe it can. Get better at go, that would take... The, most goals, most goals are, uh, it depends on how you state the goal, right? So if you say, what we've built you to do is get better at chess than any human, then it would fulfill that at some point. If the goal is get better at chess, there's no... There's no Actually, goal. I think it, he, he, the, the point is an interesting one, right? Because it, you could create an AI that started this intelligence explosion and then it fizzled because it actually saw, like if it was chess and it was able to get to the point where it could solve chess, I don't know what the... I what think chess can be solved. There are a finite right, number Right, there's a finite number, but I don't know whether they could, you, if it would require all the molecules, so well, they can fizzle. Is, does it eventually fail because of perfection? If it's an open-ended goal, no. There's no, you know, if you say, get as smart as possible, learn everything possible, there's, there's no finite amount of things to learn in the universe, so it's not going to stop. But if it's just get better at chess, probably that has a halting point. So that, then the particular goal would be absolutely critical. Please. Yeah, so uh, if I were an AI and I had 10 years of my belt and being better at chess, maybe I'd change my goals. There, there's an interesting, uh, interesting notion in, introduced in Bostrom, I'm sure it came up somewhere else before, of uh, uh, wireheading. And the idea of wireheading, it's actually, it's kind of like heroin, right? You just, like, you, you, you just change your system so that you're constantly stimulated in whatever gives you pleasure. And, um, you know, they would, you know, it's hard for us to do that, right? We're, we're chemistry-based. We don't really understand all the chemistry. We're complicated things. But if they have a drive, something that drives them, that gives them pleasure the way they've been set up, then they don't need to kind of have goals to generate that pleasure, right? They could just wire it up so it just continuously stimulates itself. So, you know, you, um, uh, you, the ultimate answer to that is, well, you could just go, go ahead and wirehead. That would be how you would change, right? How are you going to change? What kinds of goals would you change to? Well, how about that? That would be awesome. So, uh, you know, you can imagine that scenario. Um, uh, I don't know what, what the usual outcome of that is, whether uh, in, the, in the scenarios. The, the, the wireheading outcome. Um, you know, actually, I haven't fully thought, thought through that one, and that's... Um, it's interesting, but one, one question is if any of us had the ability to wirehead, which uh, has actually been achieved, it's not that hard to, to drop an electrode into the pleasure center and um, 
it's uh, insanely addictive, far more addictive than any drug is. Um, but if you had the ability to have that surgery done safely and easily and wirehead yourself, would you? I, I don't think that I would um, for complex reasons. But I, but I think there's a deeper point that you're making in this question that I want to address, and that's you're imagining what you would do if you're an AI. And so you're imagining a very human-like AI when you do that thought experiment. And there's a big problem in thinking about AI that we, we anthropomorphize it. Uh, we think of it like another human. And it might be, it might be copied very much on our brain pattern, but it might not. It may be absolutely nothing like a human. So if you're an AI whose central goal was to get better at chess, you absolutely would not change that goal after 10 years because that changing the goal wouldn't help you get better at chess, which is your whole reason for being. The only central thing that motivates you to do anything. This is why when we create these things that balance drives are so important, right? You want it to have both curiosity and an affinity for humans and, um, you know, a survival instinct and uh, you know all these different things that kind of create a sense of balance in it, um, because if you do, if you do wire up chess, and it will it will be intelligent, so it will know that chess is its goal, and that's wired in there. But that's its goal, so why would it change? It doesn't want to change it, right? So having a balanced set of goals allows it to actually consider different possibilities. So I want to point out that this is as far as Dave and I have got in this conversation. I disagree <laughs> completely, I think, but I'm not sure because we haven't hashed through this. I think balanced goals is a terrible idea and it'll get us all wiped out. I didn't out say balanced goals, I said balanced drives. Balanced drives is a terrible idea and it'll get us wiped out just a little bit slower than the, the sort of chess playing monomaniac that those, two, so, those balanced so drives will go wacky. Maybe just one more question here. Sure. I just, I think just building off of that, I think the more interesting aspect of, of his question, though, is not so much, although you may think I am anthropomorphizing now, but I think the question is, can an artificial intelligence get so intelligent that it can change its original goal in order to... But I think that was the question, and, and I think the, the thing is, it, it can. The question is, would it? I don't know. I guess why would it? To me, it seems obvious. Why would it? I mean, so, so imagine this. We, we have certain likes, dislikes, preferences, and goals. Would you like to change those? All the time. Sure. Some of the surrounding ones, but if we were able to isolate our core goals, by definition, those are the things we wouldn't voluntarily want to change. Well, well why would you change them? You change them to improve. Your environment to improve, but to survive, right? right. It's a survival so, mechanism. Or, or to survive. Would you like to change your desire to survive if that is what you're boiling it down to? So do you see, do you view AI as centralized or decentralized? And I know it's, it may, it's not a trick question, but I, I would see it decentralized only uh, out of necessity, like maybe sending out some agents to go experience climbing a mountain through some sort of a, you know, like, connected, uh, robotic, whatever. That's more, I mean, I think that's more of an implementation direction. I mean, it, I think as Seth pointed out, there are many ways that this could play out where we achieve AI and how that AI decides to deploy itself, mm -hmm. right? But it, it's, it's an interesting and important question, but it's not really that important to the scenarios of how, what happens to us, which is what we're interested in, uh, in this. I mean, in other words, this conversation is all about what happens to humanity in all of this, right? This, the, the, the bottom line here is we're saying this is going to happen. There's nothing we can do to stop it. However, we can affect the outcome if we do it right. And so what do we want to do now in terms of how, this is, how the AI is created? To, we can't really ensure, but to try to increase our chances that we end up like labs and not like grizzly bears. Is that, would you agree with that? Absolutely, and, that's the whole and I point think of, that, and I think that's whether, a good it's summary whether it's distributed or, you know, how it's implemented, that, that's interesting implementational questions, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really go to the, kind of the core outcomes well, it's, concerns. It's, it's about letting the genie out of the bottle. I mean, if it's, if it's allowed to be decentralized on its own the, volition or will. It's going to get out of the bottle. 
Right. So that th it doesn't matter how it's built, it's going to get out. Pending up something smarter than you is a tr such a risky proposition that it, I wouldn't advocate it. Again, if it, that particular question, I mean, uh, that's one of the reasons I liked Ex Machina as a movie is that they really show, they really show how just. Uh, you're not going to be able to outsmart it. <laughs> um, it's going to figure out ways to get out. So let's, let's call it for time here tonight. Sure. Let's give uh, Dave and Seth a big round of applause.